Your heart is actually a lot like the engine in your car. It has, it has valves and it has pressurized chambers and just like your engine is responsible for making the rest of the parts of your, your car run, your heart is responsible for um, the performance of a lot of the other organ functions in your body it, by getting uh, blood and nutrients to them. So your car is designed to accelerate pretty quickly every once in a while. For example, if, if you pull out in front of a car a little bit too late, you might need to slam on the pedal and rev up the engine to get your tail out of there. And similarly, your heart and blood vessels respond to acute stress by kicking into overdrive. So your heart rate and the force of contraction increase and, and your blood vessels tighten up to get blood and, and those, uh, those nutrients to that oxygen flowing around the body a little bit faster in order to support your organs and tissues. And this is a really good thing. Uh, if we're responding to an emergency, but just like we don't want to burn up the engine in our car by driving around at the max RPMs all the time, having our heart constantly operating in overdrive can be pretty damaging. And so I want to take a second and I want to talk about the damaging uh, effects of stress on our heart. And the, the first damaging effect of stress on the heart that I want to talk about uh, is related to increased blood pressure. So in response to the increased force of, of higher blood pressure during stress, the blood vessels distend a little bit, which means they get a little bit bigger. And so the, the blood vessels respond to this distension by building up a little bit more muscle and by becoming a little bit more rigid. And that increased vessel rigidity requires then more force from the pump, more force from our, our heart to move blood through the vessels because they're getting tighter, they're, they're becoming more toned. And so it leads to a vicious cycle of elevating blood pressure that, that gets higher and higher. And this can lead to a disease called hypertension, which I'll, I'll shorten as HTN. And that just refers to blood pressure that's too high. It's, it's uh, damagingly high. And one of the damaging effects of hypertension might be vascular disease. So let me write that in here. So vascular disease. And what vascular disease refers to is disease of the blood vessels. And so when blood constantly slams against our vessels at, at higher than normal pressure, our veins and arteries experience little episodes of damage. And this leads to inflammation and plaque buildup. And that plaque is super attractive to things like fat and cholesterol, which end up sticking to these little spots and, and narrowing our blood vessels. And one of the worst spots to experience this vascular disease is in our coronary arteries. And when I say coronary arteries, I'm referring to the arteries that feed our actual heart tissue. And so we call this kind of vascular disease coronary artery disease, or CAD for short. So CAD. And when these little, uh, these little vessels get clogged up, the very organ that pumps oxygen and nutrients to our whole body in the form of blood is unable to, to keep working. It actually dies because it's not getting the, the oxygen and nutrients that it needs as a tissue. And so when the heart tissue is unnourished and starts to die, we call that a heart attack. And without a working pump, the rest of our body is in real trouble. And it's not only our heart that can be damaged. Part of our metabolism or the process of us uh, breaking down food sources to get energy, that can be impacted negatively as well. So let me write down um, metabolism so that we can create a category for these damaging effects. So when we take in extra nutrients, our body stores a lot of those extra nutrients up for later use, and we build up this complex backup of reserves. But during the fight or flight response, which gets initiated by stress, our body secretes little hormones like cortisol and glucagon. So it secretes these little hormones like uh, cortisol and glucagon. And glucagon helps convert those glucose energy stores uh, back into usable forms of energy um, because we need that energy to either fight or to flee. And if the stress is just psychosocial and we aren't actually running for our lives, we don't actually need all of this extra energy. And so that extra glucose can really exacerbate metabolic conditions like diabetes, 
which is where we already have extra blood sugar. So I'm gonna write down extra blood sugar because we don't actually need the energy, so this extra blood sugar is just floating around in our blood vessels. And it's especially serious as rates of lifestyle-based diabetes are skyrocketing, especially in westernized cultures. And then on top of everything, the extra glucose can also contribute to the cardiovascular disease, which is what we were talking about before. So too much blood sugar um, because of overuse of our stress response can be really damaging to us. And as if the damaging effects of stress on our metabolism and heart weren't enough, it turns out that our reproductive abilities are, are also impeded by overstress. So let me write down reproductive. So reproductive. So it turns out that in girls, reproduction is a huge energy expense. And in terms of ovulation and uterine development, but even more so at the prospect of pregnancy and fetal development. And so this exercise naturally gets shut down as a part of the acute stress response, as a part of that fight or flight response. And so that's understandable that we probably don't need to be making babies when we're running away from, from dinosaurs or uh, when we are being chased by by mutant zombies, but it turns out that with chronic stress, which usually accompanies those kind of psychosocial stressors, the hormones involved with pregnancy like LH, luteinizing hormone, and FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and subsequently estrogen and progesterone can become chronically inhibited, making it harder to release eggs or nurture their growth. And so girls' reproductive abilities can be really dampened by chronic stress. And boys experience a similar inhibition of sex hormones, namely in a reduction in testosterone. But the real interesting thing, though, is that, that testosterone levels are much less finicky and don't depend on the precisely timed cycles that girls experience. So it's really actually hard to reduce them to the point of infertility. But the big stress-induced problem in men is actually erectile dysfunction or impotency. Because remember that when the sympathetic nervous system gets turned on, our peripheral blood vessels clamp down so we can't um, or so that we can keep more blood to our core and that means that less blood is flowing to our appendages including the penis so in fact the majority of ED doctors or erectile dysfunction doctor visits in our country aren't related to organic impotency but rather uh, psychological induced impotency often related to stress and so stress rears its ugly head in the heart and it rears its ugly head in our metabolism and it uh, it even damages and and disrupts our reproductive capacity uh, but if that weren't enough the the negative effects of stress continue into our immune function so our immune our immune function and your immune system can be divided into two major categories. You have the innate system and the, ana and the adaptive system, excuse me. The adaptive system is pretty complex. It's the one that involves all those specific white blood cells and antibodies that allow our body to remember bad stuff and, and respond specifically. But on the other hand, the innate system is more basic and generic. And you can really think of, um, think of it as the, the inflammation. So inflammation and in the short term acute stress that fight or flight kind of stress can lead to overuse of the immune system we turn on this inflammation too much and when we have too much inflammation we can start attacking good things in our body and a good example of this is arthritis when our joints become overly inflamed so we're attacking good things in our body and so that's what happens in the short term we're overusing this inflammatory response. But chronic stress causes some different problems. If our bodies get conditioned to this chronic stress, we can actually stop activating the immune system response appropriately and our immune system can become suppressed. So now stress isn't necessarily making us sick, but it is making us more susceptible to illness. And it's making us more susceptible because our body's suppressing this, uh, this immune system, which seems to be kind of acting too often. And so this has been shown in several experiments, including um, with animals and humans. So, and one example of this is decreased wound healing during stress. So research headed by Janice Keiko Glazer showed a 40% slower healing rate 
for little puncture wounds administered to graduate students right before a major exam compared to the same wounds applied during the summer vacation. Um, and then another study by Sheldon Cohen showed increased susceptibility to illness during stress. They dropped a bit of virus in individuals' noses and showed about a 20% increase in the development of colds um, for those that were reporting chronic life stressors. So while stress is designed to be a really good thing that helps get us out of danger or helps us respond to challenges, it can really have some damaging effects on the physical aspect of our well-being.